Partnerships have been a really big theme the past couple days, and that's no surprise to any of you. And I'm, my presentation will kind of summarize some of those lessons learned, and I think Erin kind of kicked that off a little bit in her presentation. And I'm putting a little bit of a spin on it and focusing on internet-based online outreach using our experiences from the private well class. And I'm hoping that, because my presentation doesn't really cover a lot of the, the how-tos and the technical aspects of what we do online, I'm hoping that some of that will come out in your questions. So I'm not really talking about, you know, that we use MailChimp for our email and things like that. I'm talking about some big picture things, but I know when I get you guys going, there's lots of questions. So hopefully we'll get into some of that. So before you registered for this conference, who had heard of the private well class? Almost everyone. That is fabulous. I'm so glad. Um, we, we did a lot of attempt at reaching out to our networks to get people here, but we were so glad that the people we've been developing these relationships with were able to finally get you guys all in one room. Um, the Private Well class was developed in 2013 as really a, an outgrowth of um, Steve's many, many years of work. He authored the entire class materials, but it, it was at a time when we knew there was this need to really provide a, a a single piece of information that would connect all these partners together. What is the basic fundamentals that well owners need to know for those that really want to take the next step, and particularly those of you who serve well owners? And that's going to be one of the big things that I'm talking about, is all of you in this room are serving well owners in some capacity. And we have some great fundamentals that we can teach, and we have these well owners, and how are we going to make that connection? And it's through all of you in this room. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about the private well class and the partnerships that we've built to use and expand and get the class into all of your hands. But I'm also leaning a little bit on our experience with wateroperator.org. Um, it's kind of our sister website, and we, that was the first project we started. We started that in 2010, and it's a resource portal for the drinking water community, for the regulated community, primarily for small community water systems. And it has a, an event calendar, a blog. We've, we've done a newsletter um, several times a month since 2010. We're on issue like number 160 now or something. And um, our experiences really are from both of these programs and running them together. And you can see that the, the websites are very similar. We've definitely leveraged um, our, all of our lessons from doing this to, to make the private well class what it is for sure. So this is, this is the big theme, is that you guys know that partnerships are what make well owners reachable, and that that's how you actually get this information and make changes happen. And we actually have data to support that. A couple years ago, Steve mentioned this before, we had some funding from CDC to conduct a study of um, 91 uh, well owner outreach programs. So do any of you remember if you participated in that survey with us? We did a survey monkey study, and then we also did a, an online forum where we had a couple discussions. So does anybody remember if they participated in that? Raise your hands. Todd? We got, yeah, Aaron and Drew. All right, so we have some of you here. And um, this particular data we're showing, this is a, in a self-evaluation of the success of your program. We asked people to focus on just you know, think of your program as either an ongoing thing or one particular instance of your program and rate it on from not very successful to successful. And we were able to show that people who felt their programs were very successful had an average of 3.2 partners compared to those who felt their pro programs were not very successful. They had 1.4 partners. And so that it, it's, it's always good to have some numbers to support what we already know, that, that partnerships really work. And we're also seeing that sometimes it's those innovative partnerships, and, and I think we have some more presentations tomorrow that will highlight even more of those, that it's when you can get people through a different way, through the kids, through some sort of business in, the, in your community, that's, that sometimes can make the difference in how you're getting messages out to new audiences. So I'm answering two questions today. The first one is, why do par partnerships increase program success? And I think you guys know some of these answers, and we're gonna, I'm gonna highlight the big picture. But then also, how does the internet impact those partnerships? How does it enhance or sometimes take away from it? And how does it really affect our program strategy? 
So partnership resources, of course, that's, that's where we always start. That when you have a partnership, you can share costs, whether you're actually doing some sort of division of labor or you're getting a partner to supplement part of the cost of something. Um, Aaron was mentioning that CERCAP provided some funding for their, their, their testing, and so those types of partnerships are the one of the easiest things that we can get at to make sure that we can um, uh, actually get done the things we wanna do. And then also the workload. We're all not just strapped for cash, we're strapped for time, and the partnerships help divvy up that workload so that we can um, actually bring those, all those, <laughs> those Envision and those beautiful websites that we wanna be great, uh, bring them to life. But then when we add this online component, which obviously has been a transition and it's always ever evolving over the past decade or so, but now we have reduced printing costs because we can transmit things electronically. We have reduced travel costs so we can have webinars and emails. And a lot of the things that we used to have to do by hand, we can supplement with online outreach. And it doesn't mean that you're going to be doing only outright uh, online, because we know how valuable even this experience is here today. You can never replace the value of face-to-face -face interaction and the trust that that builds. But it can bridge those gaps, especially when funding seems scarcer and scarcer. So partners also amplify the reach of your message. Um, getting it out to just different audiences, because when you have that trust, um, and partners have their own audiences that they're communicating with, you can, you can reach them in a better way. But when you're doing it online, that message can spread even faster. Um, many of us probably don't have viral campaigns, but maybe some of you do, but th there's still this, this speed of delivery that you can get when you're having online communication. Um, we were even talking about, should we have emailed you on the very last day to go to a happy hour? And we weren't sure that would be quite fast enough. We were trying to figure out, is there a text messaging service that we could use to mass text all of you to tell you what bar to go to? And we decided against it, because we figured 120 people wouldn't fit all in one bar in Champagne. Um, <laughs> but um, this, the speed of technology is really an asset today, and the fact that we can even you know, make changes and course corrections along the way. Also, the results are so much more trackable. And all of us are under a lot of pressure to show the return on investment for all of our efforts, and to showing that everything we're doing is making a difference and that people are taking actions. And with these online mechanisms, there's so much technology that you can add to it to, to literally show the source of every single new person you're serving. And of course, there's this potential for exponential reach. Um, there is offline as well. You're giving a message to one person and they're sharing it with their network, but online that is even faster and you can reach even more people. And you know, one context that I didn't give at the beginning is that you guys all know Steve because he travels around the country and he loves to talk to people and never, you know, stops doing that and it's great. But I'm much happier behind the computer and that's why I'm here talking about online education. Um, because I think that both of them are a good balance and that's um, when, when you have both of those together in, in a program, I think that's when we're seeing success and that's when also we're, we're seeing more ability to attract the younger, younger generations into our community and into our industries because we're, we are being tech savvy and we are, um, it's not just the old school guys out in the field anymore, it's the younger folks that are online too. So, one of the benefits of partnerships is partners are creating that local buy-in. When you're trying to give a message, particularly if you're a regulatory agency, people may not want to listen to you. Um, you're in some sort of power position. You know, Peter was talking about how he's the, the iron fist and Allison is the velvet glove, and <laughs> which we did tweet out for him. Um, when you have that, you want to have, make sure you have that velvet glove in your, in your corner so that you have that trusted source that somebody's going to listen to. And then when you go online, this, the online partnerships help to bridge the gap. And so I think it's so fascinating that most of you found us through our website. Um, you, probably, you may have heard of us from via the internet, somebody forwarded you something, and maybe you heard it at a conference, or maybe you heard it from somebody told you face to face. But having both of these is bridging that gap between online and off. And so we're hoping that you go out there and you share that there's this great online resource, especially with your colleagues who are then going to share it in person with somebody else. And so there's this back and forth between online and off, and it just magnifies our impact. 
And then there's also the, the possibility of this increased trust from having that multiplicity of messages, that the more the messages get, gets out there, the more your audience is gonna trust it because they're seeing it from different sources. You know those ads that follow you around on, on the internet when you search for a pair of shoes or whatever, now they're on every single website that you search for? You know, that there is a value to that. People, advertisers do that because it works, because when you see things in multiple places, you're more likely to take that action. So my primary case study is, is what our program, the private well class. And we started with this question of what are, the, what are the needs that well owners have? Well, they need answers to immediate questions. And sometimes we can provide those answers, but most of the time we know that we need to send them to more localized information. And we don't ever claim to have all of the answers. We claim to provide a great foundation and fundamentals of how groundwater works, how your well works, and um, but we know that it's the local experts who know the geology, who know the local health concerns that are gonna be the ones that we want you to then go to. And they need this understanding of the fundamentals, which is what we cover, and plus they, but they need also those access to additional resources. And so we had this kind of conflict of, we can't build this class that's gonna solve everything, and we can't also, um, but we, we need to provide something, and it needs to be more than just the basic information. Um, I know that, I think, Steve will, will agree with me that he wanted to go more than just the checklist of what well owners need to do. They, they wanted to um, both increase the knowledge base of well owners so they're helping themselves and each other, their colleagues, their friends, and then also increase their empowerment to go after and, and do their own things and then know the point at which they need to contact a driller or somebody else to help them. So if you take these well-owner needs, then you take, here's our program. We provide these core resources through our 10-week email class, through our webinars, through, um, and then all the work that we do with our, our partners, you guys here in this audience, and I'll talk about a little bit about that in a minute. And I think what we also try to do is we, we maintain this clear vision of what it is we're all trying to do here together. And that's one of the reasons why we're having this conference, is that we want to be a leader helping to connect all of you around similar messages of what are the things that well owners need to understand, what are the actions we want them to take, and how can we all be really consistent in providing the, the best information we can. And, to, and to, with that, build this national awareness. And we, you know, a lot of the presentations have emphasized how much lack of awareness is still out there. And we're very much hoping that you guys go home and share um, for back of a lot of terms, our awesomeness and the awesomeness of collectively of all of you guys um, with each other and with your colleagues so that this movement kind of amplifies even further. <coughs> and then of course, we're serving as a facilitator. We very much know that these relationships that you're, you are building here today are going to impact the programs you do down the road. Um, yeah, I know that I've been sending emails to my colleagues about new things we can do. I think the Illinois State Water Survey should have their own Be Well Informed tool. And, um, there's always lots of ideas, and I hope all of you are generating new ideas as well. And, and so when it comes to partnerships, we, we knew that we have something that we really wanted to do, and we had these well owners, and we knew that, that all of the partners in these categories are kind of, they're almost in between us, and that we knew that we could not do it without you. And sure, we want well owners taking our class, but we want you guys taking the class and then sharing it with other well owners. We know that there's, due to just the sheer quantity of people in our audience that without you guys, it wouldn't be possible. So our partnership with, with EPA is of course what makes this all possible because they give us funding and that comes through RCAP. And one of the things that, that wasn't really mentioned here is that when EPA gives us funding, gives RCAP funding for this program, it actually comes in this source water protection concept, context. EPA is not doing it because they really care or really have the, the authority to care about drinking water or to care about private wells. They're doing it because they care about public drinking water systems and they want to make sure that private wells are not contaminating public water supplies. So I think that's, that's kind of an important thing, um, particularly in this um, landscape right now that that's, that's the context that, that the federal sector is looking at for private wells. And I think that's also something, if you're not putting that in your, your language about what you're doing, that's another way to hook in um, funders for your work. 
And then of course, RCAP has been totally instrumental in helping us kind of expand this national network and making connections within each of their regions with all of you all um, for all of the on the ground work that Steve talked about in his presentations. And, and so when it comes to, to online, um, I would say Niha, and unfortunately Crystal Tate uh, couldn't be here today. Um, she's our main contact with the National Environmental Health Association. But our relationship with her has been really important because when, when we first started the class, we saw that 20% that of our participants were environmental health professionals and registered sanitarians. And they were, like all of you are saying, this class really hits a need. This wasn't part of my, my ongoing, my training that I received. We had just a little bit and I'm answering all these questions, um, but they wanted to get CE credit for it. Um, and that's a reminder, don't forget to sign in and out down the hallway, <laughs> but uh, we know how important it was for you to maintain your continuing education um, credits, and so we wanted to make sure that, was, that happened. And so we worked closely with NEHA to create basically a duplicate copy of our class inside their learning management system so that we could, they could offer the CE credits for it. But then also they offer CE credits for our webinars for this conference here today as well. And then that relationship is even growing because even home inspectors now are able to take the class on NEHA's website in order to get credit for their licenses. So this is just an example of, of NEHA's website and they have this full e-learning platform on a variety of topics and they've, they've partnered with a lot of different organizations to provide this kind of um, shared learning environment to make sure that they're um, credentialed members. And even those who, who don't necessarily have a credential, you can have, I think it's like you pay like $7 or something for NEHA to take it through their class and have them keep track that they, that they you took the class through them. Um, NGWA obviously has been a really important partner for us. They've been, they've been in this business for a really long time with wellowner.org, and we, I think we've had a really good relationship with, with Cliff and the other folks at the association to make sure that we are um, reaching well owners the best way we can. And in that way, I, I certain, there's a little bit where I disagree with Aaron, that I think that duplication is important, and I don't like disagreeing with anybody, Steve knows that, but uh, <laughs> I, I think... <laughs> that um, we all have a really big role to play and that all the efforts we do add up to something and because of the number of well owners, we no one of us, no one organization can reach them all. And the more we do, and as long as we're consistent with our messaging, particularly with, you know, on topics like shot chlorination, the things that people really ask about on testing, the more that we're consistent, we can all use the approaches that we are, use our own strengths to get out there and, and to reach well owners. And this is just the example of wellowner.org that's, that's been shown before. And, and we really like how this website has a lot of the really basic information. Um, they do really well in Google search rankings, that's always great. And they also, under the lessons and webinar section, they link back to us. So we're, we're, we have a good relationship with all of our partners in trying to, to cross promote through this EPA grant. And I, and I think, when EPA put out the RFA for the, for the private well work, we were nervous. You know, who are gonna be our competitors? Well, we were able to get the players in private wells all on the same grant so that we could work together to make sure that we're consistent in doing the best job that we can. So I think, I think we're all feel really proud of that. Water Systems Council, we heard from, from them yesterday, are also a partner with this and they have their well care hotline, additional free resources. Um, when our RCAP staff were, were going around the country doing their one-on-one their -on -one trainings, they have the Water Systems Council manual to hand out. We, didn't wanna, we don't want to reinvent the wheel at any time. Um, we want to leverage the resources that are already out there. Here's the example of that manual. And they have an example of a checklist. That's one reason why we haven't created a checklist, is because we want to make sure that we're leading people to the resources that already exist and they're already great out there. Extension, we can't underscore that uh, relationship well enough. You know, you've heard from, from these folks uh, already on this list. Um, as part of the Illinois Water Resources Center, I'm technically part of Extension as well, and I'm, I know that I was talking with my colleagues that were super interested in, in learning more about what Extension does and um, trying to make sure that, that our private well work is, is reaching into that within Illinois as well, because we don't, um, and is, is Peggy still here? I didn't, oh, she left, okay. So yeah, or Dwayne? They're both, they're, they both left. They both left, okay. So we did have two folks here from Illinois Extension and um, 
it, it's super fascinating to see these audiences that we previously weren't familiar with because you know I came from the EPA world and we have relationship with the environmental health world, but I think obviously extension is where it's at when it comes to um, things that are already happening. So definitely that partnership is, is important as well for both established and all the programs that you guys have that are growing. So, so we're back to this graph of, of all the partners, and I covered some of the ones that are, have a more national reach because we felt like, you know, in many ways, they're kind of, they're our peers. These are the people who are re trying to reach the same audiences. And I see this very much as a model for what you guys should be doing. You should be looking at the people who are trying to reach the same audiences as you are. And we may have different missions, but how can we share those messages um, with the audiences that we're talking to? So in the private well class program, our, our partner work I would argue is one of the most important things that we do. Um, yes, we have our content, we have our webinars, we have the class, we even have a, a podcast and, and, a, and a whole lot of videos. And I think these are resources we want you guys sharing and it's the work that you do that's most important. And I would say this is not the fanciest slide, but I think it's one of the most important in here because we made hundreds and hundreds of calls when we first got started. And I would say that is fundamental to our success, is having these phone calls so that people even knew that we existed and what we were trying to do. And I bet many of you in, your, in this room received phone calls from us um, when we were just getting started. And so I, I never want to dismiss the power of direct contact. And I know that a lot of those relationships were also developed when Steve was traveling around the country introducing our program to folks. We still maintain a partner newsletter. If you're not already getting our partner newsletter, we send it out once a month. And now that you're here at our conference, you will start getting our partner newsletter. And that's how we, we intend to continue keeping you guys informed of opportunities to continue working together, of what's going on around the country so that we can really keep this going. Um, and our, you know, Katie Hollenbeck had, um, arranged with all of the speakers to make sure that all of our presentations were in well in advance. And she runs that partner newsletter. Um, and we continue to do niche webinars. So we have webinars that are for, designed specifically for homeowners, and then we also do webinars that are for the professional audiences. We do ones for environmental health professionals, realtors, laboratories, um, and we also do webinars in Spanish. So we're continuing to try to refine our messages so that we are talking to the people who need to hear it most and spinning it in the right context so they wanna sign up and attend. Of course, we have all of our free content, free content and then we're very active on social media. We're active on Twitter and Facebook, and we've been you know, tweeting, live tweeting this entire time and seeing many of you guys that are also on Twitter and are reposting us as well. And we're, one of the things we're interested in is exploring is whether or not you guys are interested in having a LinkedIn group to continue talking after the conference. So, thanks, hi, Duki. So, uh, I saw one nod. Is there anybody else who's on LinkedIn and would be interested in participating in a group? So I think that's enough to say that this might work. So LinkedIn groups are, you know, LinkedIn is the professional network they've recently redesigned in order to be a little bit more like Facebook, but your friends aren't on there, you're just your colleagues. And so I think that it's a good way for us to stay engaged in a way that's not some other forum where you have to go log in. So here's just an example of our, of our environmental health professional webinars. We do record every single one of our webinars and post them on the website. So if you ever were to miss it, um, and one thing that's interesting is even if you've attended the webinar before, the questions are different every single time. So there's always something new to learn, and I'm sure Steve and Walt and Dan, the people who help answer our questions know for sure that there's always something new. So here's our, our final takeaways here. So outreach, of course, does not negate the face-to-face -face interaction. We're seeing that very well this week, and I, I never want to say that it does, but it, it's a great asset to augment everything that we do, particularly in light of budget crunches. I think it's important for you to know your strengths, to know where you exceed, and to follow those and, and do the best that you can with, with your strengths, but avoid being territorial. When we, were, when we were applying for the EPA funding, we could have said, this is what we do. We don't want to partner with anyone else. We, we think we're the best, but we know that that's not true. We know that all of us are in this together and that, um, as I, the quote said in the beginning, a rising tide lifts all boats. The more we work together, the more we'll be able to reach well owners. 
Uh, definitely don't reinvent, leverage the resources that are available. We really want you guys to be using our resources and those of our partners to spread things out. I think a lot of people are going to be stealing the source code for the Be Well Informed tool for their own state websites or promoting that within their state. So anything that we can do to leverage what's already been done um, also looks good to our funders who want to fund us in the future to know that we are using our resources wisely. Um, this is an interesting one. So I want you to choose the trusted messenger for your message. Some of the times you are not going to be the most trusted messenger. And some of you already know that and some of you don't. And it's something you need to think about. That who's going to be the trusted person that this well owner is going to listen to? Maybe it's the kids. Maybe it's somebody else. Maybe it's the, the police department. You, know, you never know who your good partner is going to be and who's going to be the trusted source of that message. Um, and then remember, of course, that partnerships are just one part of an effective outreach program. Um, if the rest of your stuff kind of stinks, then a partnership, your partners aren't going to want to promote it. So <laughs> it has to be really part of what you do. Um, in 2016, um, uh, Steve and, and Walt and, and a, a previous um, person that worked for us, Lucinda Morris, published this paper, uh, Methods of Conducting Effective Outreach to Private Well Owners, a Literature Review and Model Approach. And the, the reference is there at the bottom. It's in the Journal of Water and Health. And th this diagram comes from that. And it just shows that the steps that you take to build an effective outreach program and partnerships are just, of course, one part of that. If you're interested in learning more about this, that June 26 training that Steve mentioned, a portion of that training is on effective outreach, all based on that paper, as well as our CDC study. Uh, and then the rest of that is on the assessment tool. And that's it. Clay Trackman, Louisiana Department of Health. Um, I know you mentioned LinkedIn, and what about Facebook? I mean, everybody uses Facebook. You could set up a group there. I know all LinkedIn, I find, get all these emails from. It's kind of annoying. Sure. Asking me to, huh? Turn those off. Well, I'm not even on it. They just keep asking me to join it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a couple points on Facebook. Um, I've talked to people before and they expressed concern or interest in keeping their personal and professional very separate. Um, so that would be one, I love Facebook groups for a lot of other things that I do, but that would be a reason why we, we probably wouldn't choose it for this. Um, it doesn't mean that Facebook's not important, particularly for our audience, that reaching private well owners, Facebook is one of the very best places that you can do that. Um, I wouldn't ever, we've tested even doing Facebook ads, and I know that um, our partners in the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant program do Facebook ads all the time, so that even if you have to pay a little bit, it could be as little as five or ten dollars to get in front of your right audience, you, you can get people there. So um, I, I do appreciate that, and I know I, I don't personally use LinkedIn that much either, but that personal versus professional is a concern for a lot of people. Andrew Pappas, Indiana State Department of Health. Um, one quick comment, just the Water System Council put out a publication, Who Owns the Water? And that may be a really valuable tool to, to get to policymakers and elected officials to help them understand uh, maybe state by state discrepancies and some similarities. Uh, and maybe even for people in this room to understand how they may not be very similar to this, the state next door to them. Um, and so I, I just think that'd be maybe a, a good future look maybe in the next couple of years on how to present maybe a little bit more of a policy approach to it, um, mm -hmm. but still being very broad without giving sp specific recommendations. Yeah, and also inside of our class, we have a section on uh, water rights issues, and that one goes into more detail. So that's a great, great offer. And they just updated that yeah. this last year. Yeah, so it should be pretty up to date. Any other questions? Jason. Yes. Jason Barrett, Mississippi State University Extension. My question is, because um, I think y'all do a phenomenal job of promoting the private well functions at events across the nation. Is there a preferred method if people want to communicate to you something that's going on in their state? Is there a preferred method to communicate that to you all? The best way is to email info at privatewellclass.org. And that's actually on the CEU sheet in the back of your binder as well. So that's the best way if you have questions about anything we do or you want to get information to us. Um, unless you have a specific question for Steve, I wouldn't send it to him because he gets a lot of email. So. We 
do have a phone number on our webpage too. Yes. So, and our staff at the water survey answer that. So, so I'm, I'm one per I'm sorry, Pete Pippo, uh, State of Rhode Island. <clears throat> so, in my office, I'm one person. I do private wells, and the rest of the people in my office do public water. They have all kinds of associations that they go to, the American Water Works Association, the New England Association, all the different associations. Um, have you considered converting this to an association of people who do work in private well? I mean, you're situated, you've got the lists, you've got, have you considered that as a, a thing to do? We talk about tomorrow at the end of the day. So, because hmm. there's been several people who've come up to me and said, we need to find a way to keep this going. Um, and so, you know, we, we didn't know if this was going to work or it's going to be a flop, right? Because it's not been done before. Yeah. So, um, so it's certainly something we should discuss about yeah. what the best approach is to get everybody engaged and keep everybody in the loop. Thank you. Now, this is just really good work. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great idea. All right. Thank you.